Book Three, Chapter Three, Part One of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Three, Chapter Three. No Matter, Part One of Two. Within another year, Anthony and Gloria had become like players who had lost their costumes, lacking the pride to continue on the note of tragedy, so that, when Mrs. and Miss Helm of Kansas City cut them dead in the plaza one evening, it was only that Mrs. and Miss Helm, like most people, abominated mirrors of their atavistic selves. Their new apartment, for which they paid eighty-five dollars a month, was situated on Claremont Avenue, which is two blocks from the Hudson, in the dim hundreds. They had lived there a month when Muriel Kane came to see them late one afternoon. It was a reproachless twilight on the summer side of spring. Anthony lay upon the lounge, looking up 127th Street toward the river, near which he could just see a single patch of vivid green trees that guaranteed the brummagem umbrageousness of Riverside Drive. Across the water were the palisades, crowned by the ugly framework of the amusement park. Yet soon it would be dusk, and those same iron cobwebs would be a glory against the heavens, an enchanted palace set over the smooth radiance of a tropical canal. The streets near the apartment, Anthony had found, were streets where children played, streets a little nicer than those he had been used to pass on his way to Marietta, but of the same general sort, with an occasional hand organ or hurdy-gurdy, and in the cool of the evening many pairs of young girls walking down to the corner drug store for ice cream soda and dreaming unlimited dreams under the low heavens. Dusk in the streets now, and children playing, shouting up incoherent ecstatic words that faded out close to the open window, and Muriel, who had come to find Gloria, chattering to him from an opaque gloom over across the room. "'Light the lamp, why don't we?' she suggested. "'It's getting ghostly in here.' With a tired movement he arose and obeyed. The grey window panes vanished. He stretched himself. He was heavier now. His stomach was a limp weight against his belt. His flesh had softened and expanded. He was thirty-two, and his mind was a bleak and disordered wreck. "'Have a little drink, Muriel?' "'Not me, thanks. I don't use it any more. "'What are you doing these days, Anthony?' she asked curiously. "'Well, I've been pretty busy with this lawsuit,' he answered indifferently. "'It's gone to the Court of Appeals. Ought to be settled up one way or the other by autumn.' There's been some objection as to whether the Court of Appeals has jurisdiction over the matter. Muriel made a clicking sound with her tongue and cocked her head on one side. Well, you tell him. I never heard of anything taking so long. Oh, they all do, he replied listlessly. All will cases. They say it's exceptional to have one settled under four or five years. Oh, Muriel daringly changed her tack. Why don't you go to work, you lazy? At what? he demanded abruptly. Why, at anything, I suppose. You're still a young man. If that's encouragement, I'm much obliged, he answered dryly. And then, with sudden weariness, does it bother you particularly that I don't want to work? It doesn't bother me, but it does bother a lot of people who claim, Oh, God, he said brokenly. It seems to me that for three years I've heard nothing about myself but wild stories and virtuous admonitions. I'm tired of it. If you don't want to see us, let us alone. I don't bother my former friends, but I need no charity calls and no criticism disguised as good advice. Then he added, apologetically, I'm sorry, but really, Muriel, you mustn't talk like a lady slum worker, even if you are visiting the lower middle classes. He turned his bloodshot eyes on her reproachfully, eyes that had once been a deep, clear blue, that were weak now, strained and half ruined from reading when he was drunk. Why do you say such awful things? she protested. You talk as if you and Gloria were in the middle classes. Why pretend we're not? I hate people who claim to be great aristocrats when they can't even keep up the appearances of it. Do you think a person has to have money to be aristocratic? Muriel, the horrified Democrat. Why, of course. Aristocracies only in admission that certain traits which we call fine, courage and honor and beauty and all that sort of thing, can best be developed in a favorable environment where you don't have the warpings of ignorance and necessity. Muriel bit her lower lip and waved her head from side to side. Well, all I say is that if a person comes from a good family, they're always nice people. That's the trouble with you and Gloria. 
You think that just because things aren't going your way right now, all your old friends are trying to avoid you. You're too sensitive. As a matter of fact, said Anthony, you know nothing at all about it. With me, it's simply a matter of pride, and for once, Gloria's reasonable enough to agree that we oughtn't go where we're not wanted. And people don't want us. We're too much the ideal bad examples. Nonsense. You can't park your pessimism in my little sudden parlor. I think you ought to forget all those morbid speculations and go to work. Here I am, thirty-two. Suppose I did start in at some idiotic business. Perhaps in two years I might rise to fifty dollars a week, with luck. That's if I could get a job at all. There's an awful lot of unemployment. Well, suppose I made fifty a week. Do you think I'd be any happier? Do you think that if I don't get this money of my grandfather's, life will be endurable? Muriel smiled complacently. Well, she said, that may be clever, but it isn't common sense. A few minutes later Gloria came in, seeming to bring with her into the room some dark color, indeterminate and rare. In a taciturn way she was happy to see Muriel. She greeted Anthony with a casual, Hi! I've been talking philosophy with your husband, cried the irrepressible Miss Kane. We took up some fundamental concepts, said Anthony, a faint smile disturbing his pale cheeks, paler still under two days' growth of beard. Oblivious to his irony, Muriel rehashed her contention. When she had done, Gloria said quietly, Anthony's right. It's no fun to go around when you have the sense that people are looking at you in a certain way. He broke in plaintively. Don't you think that when even Maury Noble, who was my best friend, won't come to see us, it's high time to stop calling people up? Tears were standing in his eyes. That was your fault about Maury Noble, said Gloria coolly. It wasn't. It most certainly was. Muriel intervened quickly. I met a girl who knew Maury the other day, and she says he doesn't drink any more. He's getting pretty cagey. Doesn't? Practically not at all. He's making piles of money. He's sort of changed since the war. He's going to marry a girl in Philadelphia who has millions. Ceci Larrabee. Anyway, that's what the town tattle said. He's thirty-three, said Anthony, thinking aloud. But it's odd to imagine his getting married. I used to think he was so brilliant. He was, murmured Gloria, in a way. But brilliant people don't settle down in business, or do they? Or what do they do? Or what becomes of everybody you used to know and have so much in common with? You drift apart, suggested Muriel with the appropriate dreamy look. They change, said Gloria. All the qualities that they don't use in their daily lives get cobwebbed up. The last thing he said to me, recollected Anthony, was that he was going to work so as to forget there was nothing worth working for. Muriel caught at this quickly. That's what you ought to do, she exclaimed triumphantly. Of course I shouldn't think anybody would want to work for nothing, but it'd give you something to do. What do you do with yourselves, anyway? Nobody ever sees you at Montre or, or anywhere. Are you economizing? Gloria laughed scornfully, glancing at Anthony from the corners of her eyes. Well, he demanded, what are you laughing at? You know what I'm laughing at, she answered coldly. At that case of whiskey? Yes. She turned to Muriel. He paid seventy-five dollars for a case of whiskey yesterday. What if I did? It's cheaper that way than if you get it by the bottle. You needn't pretend that you won't drink any of it. At least I don't drink in the daytime. That's a fine distinction, he cried, springing to his feet in a weak rage. What's more, I'll be damned if you can hurl that at me every few minutes. It's true. It is not. And I'm getting sick of this eternal business of criticizing me before visitors. He had worked himself up to such a state that his arms and shoulders were visibly trembling. You'd think everything was my fault. You'd think you hadn't encouraged me to spend money, and spent a lot more on yourself than I ever did by a long shot. Now Gloria rose to her feet. I won't let you talk to me that way. All right, then. By heaven, you don't have to. In a sort of rush, he left the room. The two women heard his steps in the hall, and then the front door banged. Gloria sank back into her chair. Her face was lovely in the lamplight, composed, inscrutable. Oh, cried Muriel in distress. Oh, what is the matter? Nothing particularly. He's just drunk. Drunk? Why, he's perfectly sober. He talked. Gloria shook her head. Oh, no, he doesn't show it any more unless he can hardly stand up. And he talks all right until he gets excited. He talks much better than he does when he's sober. But he's been sitting here all day drinking, except for the time it took him to walk to the corner for a newspaper. Oh, how terrible! 
Muriel was sincerely moved, her eyes filled with tears. Has this happened much? Drinking, you mean? No, this, leaving you. Oh, yes, frequently. He'll come in about midnight, and weep and ask me to forgive him. And do you? I don't know. We just go on. The two women sat there in the lamplight and looked at each other, each in a different way helpless before this thing. Gloria was still pretty, as pretty as she would ever be again. Her cheeks were flushed, and she was wearing a new dress that she had bought, imprudently, for fifty dollars. She had hoped she could persuade Anthony to take her out tonight, to a restaurant or even to one of the great gorgeous moving picture palaces, where there would be a few people to look at her, at whom she could bear it to look in turn. She wanted this because she knew her cheeks were flushed, and because her dress was new and becomingly fragile. Only very occasionally, now, did they receive any invitations, but she did not tell these things to Muriel. "'Gloria, dear, I wish we could have dinner together, but I promised a man, and it's seven-thirty already. I've got to tear. Oh, I couldn't anyway. In the first place, I've been ill all day. I couldn't eat a thing.' After she had walked with Muriel to the door, Gloria came back into the room, turned out the lamp, and leaning her elbows on the window-sill, looked out at Palisades Park, where the brilliant revolving circle of the Ferris wheel was like a trembling mirror catching the yellow reflection of the moon. The street was quiet now. The children had gone in. Over the way she could see a family at dinner. Pointlessly, ridiculously, they rose and walked about the table. Seen thus, all that they did appeared incongruous. It was as though they were being jiggled carelessly and to no purpose by invisible overhead wires. She looked at her watch. It was eight o'clock. She had been pleased for a part of the day, in the early afternoon, in walking along that Broadway of Harlem, 125th Street, with her nostrils alert to many odors, and her mind excited by the extraordinary beauty of some Italian children. It affected her curiously, as Fifth Avenue had affected her once, in the days when, with the placid confidence of beauty, she had known that it was all hers, every shop and all it held, every adult toy glittering in a window, all hers for the asking. Here on 125th Street there were Salvation Army bands, and spectrum-shawled old ladies on doorsteps, and sugary, sticky candy in the grimy hands of shiny-haired children, and the late sun striking down on the sides of the tall tenements, all very rich and racy and savory, like a dish by a provident French chef one could not help enjoying, even though one knew that the ingredients were probably leftovers. Gloria shuddered suddenly as a river siren came moaning over the dusky roofs, and leaning back in till the ghostly curtains fell from her shoulder, she turned on the electric lamp. It was growing late. She knew there was some change in her purse, and she considered whether she would go down and have some coffee and rolls, where the liberated subway made a roaring cave of Manhattan Street, or eat the deviled ham and bread in the kitchen. Her purse decided for her. It contained a nickel and two pennies. After an hour, the silence of the room had grown unbearable, and she found that her eyes were wandering from her magazine to the ceiling, toward which she stared without thought. Suddenly she stood up, hesitated for a moment, biting at her finger. Then she went to the pantry, took down a bottle of whiskey from the shelf, and poured herself a drink. She filled up the glass with ginger ale, and, returning to her chair, finished an article in the magazine. It concerned the last revolutionary widow, who, when a young girl, had married an ancient veteran of the Continental Army, and who had died in 1906. It seemed strange and oddly romantic to Gloria that she and this woman had been contemporaries. She turned the page and learned that a candidate for Congress was being accused of atheism by an opponent. Gloria's surprise vanished when she found that the charges were false. The candidate had merely denied the miracle of the loaves and fishes. He admitted, under pressure, that he gave full credence to the stroll upon the water. Finishing her first drink, Gloria got herself a second. After slipping on a negligee and making herself comfortable on the lounge, she became conscious that she was miserable, and that the tears were rolling down her cheeks. She wondered if they were tears of self-pity, and tried resolutely not to cry, but this existence, without hope, without happiness, oppressed her, and she kept shaking her head from side to side, her mouth drawn down tremulously in the corners, as though she were denying an assertion made by someone, somewhere. She did not know that this gesture of hers was years older than history, that, 
for a hundred generations of men intolerable and persistent grief has offered that gesture of denial of protest of bewilderment to something more profound more powerful than the god made in the image of man and before which that god did he exist would be equally impotent it is a truth set at the heart of tragedy that this force never explains never answers this force intangible as air more definite than death richard caramel early in the summer anthony resigned from his last club the amsterdam he had come to visit it hardly twice a year and the dues were a recurrent burden he had joined it on his return from italy because it had been his grandfather's club and his father's and because it was a club that given the opportunity one indisputably joined but as a matter of fact he had preferred the harvard club largely because of dick and moray however with the decline of his fortunes it had seemed an increasingly desirable bauble to cling to it was relinquished at the last with some regret his companions numbered now a curious dozen several of them he had met in a place called sammy's on forty-third street where if one knocked on the door and were favorably passed on from behind a grating one could sit around a great round table drinking fairly good whiskey it was here that he encountered a man named parker allison who had been exactly the wrong sort of rounder at harvard and who was running through a large yeast fortune as rapidly as possible parker allison's notion of distinction consisted in driving a noisy red and yellow racing car up broadway with two glittering hard-eyed girls beside him he was the sort who dined with two girls rather than one his imagination was almost incapable of sustaining a dialogue. Besides Allison, there was Pete Lytell, who wore a grey derby on the side of his head. He always had money, and he was customarily cheerful, so Anthony held aimless, long-winded conversation with him through many afternoons of the summer and fall. Lytell, he found, not only talked, but reasoned in phrases. His philosophy was a series of them, assimilated here and there, through an active, thoughtless life. He had phrases about socialism, the immemorial ones. He had phrases pertaining to the existence of a personal deity, something about one time when he had been in a railroad accident. And he had phrases about the Irish problem, the sort of woman he respected, and the futility of prohibition. The only time his conversation ever rose superior to these muddled clauses with which he interpreted the most rococo happenings in a life that had been more than usually eventful was when he got down to the detailed discussion of his most animal existence. He knew, to a subtlety, the foods, the liquor, and the women that he preferred. He was at once the commonest and most remarkable product of civilization. He was nine out of ten people that one passes on a city street, and he was a hairless ape with two dozen tricks. He was the hero of a thousand romances of life and art, and he was a virtual moron, performing staidly yet absurdly a series of complicated and infinitely astounding epics over a span of threescore years with men such as these two anthony patch drank and discussed and drank and argued he liked them because they knew nothing about him because they lived in the obvious and had not the faintest conception of the inevitable continuity of life they sat not before a motion picture with consecutive reels but at a musty, old-fashioned travelogue, with all values stark, and hence all implications confused. Yet they themselves were not confused, because there was nothing in them to be confused. They changed phrases from month to month, as they changed neckties. Anthony, the courteous, the subtle, the perspicacious, was drunk each day, in Sammy's with these men, in the apartment, over a book, some book he knew, and, very rarely, with Gloria, who, in his eyes, had begun to develop the unmistakable outlines of a quarrelsome and unreasonable woman. She was not the Gloria of old, certainly, the Gloria who, had she been sick, would have preferred to inflict misery upon every one around her rather than confess that she needed sympathy or assistance. She was not above whining now. She was not above being sorry for herself. Each night, when she prepared for bed, she smeared her face with some new ungent, which she hoped, illogically, would give back the glow and freshness to her vanishing beauty. When Anthony was drunk, he taunted her about this. When he was sober, he was polite to her, on occasions even tender. He seemed to show, for short hours, a trace of that old quality of understanding, too well to blame, that quality which was the best of him, and had worked swiftly and ceaselessly toward his ruin. But he hated to be sober. It made him conscious of the people around him, 
of that air of struggle, of greedy ambition, of hope more sordid than despair, of incessant passage up or down, which, in every metropolis, is most in evidence through the unstable middle class. Unable to live with the rich, he thought that his next choice would have been to live with the very poor. Anything was better than this cup of perspiration and tears. The sense of the enormous panorama of life, never strong in Anthony, had become dim almost to extinction. At long intervals now some incident, some gesture of Gloria's, would take his fancy, but the gray veils had come down in earnest upon him. As he grew older those things faded, after that there was wine. There was a kindliness about intoxication. There was that indescribable gloss and glamour it gave, like the memories of ephemeral and faded evenings. After a few highballs, there was magic in the tall, glowing Arabian night of the Bush Terminal building, its summit a peak of sheer grandeur, gold and dreaming against the inaccessible sky, and Wall Street, the crass, the banal. Again it was the triumph of gold, a gorgeous sentient spectacle. It was where the great kings kept the money for their wars. The fruit of youth or of the grape, the transitory magic of the brief passage from darkness to darkness, the old illusion that truth and beauty were in some way entwined. As he stood in front of Delmonico's, lighting a cigarette one night, he saw two hansoms drawn up close to the curb, waiting for a chance drunken fare. The outmoded cabs were worn and dirty, the cracked patent leather wrinkled like an old man's face, the cushions faded to a brownish lavender. The very horses were ancient and weary, so were the white-haired men who sat aloft, cracking their whips with a grotesque affectation of gallantry, a relic of vanished gaiety. Anthony Patch walked away in a sudden fit of depression, pondering the bitterness of such survivals. There was nothing, it seemed, that grew stale so soon as pleasure. On 42nd Street one afternoon he met Richard Caramel for the first time in many months, a prosperous, fattening Richard Caramel, whose face was filling out to match the Bostonian brow. "'Just got in this week from the coast. Was going to call you up, but I didn't know your new address. We've moved.' Richard Caramel noticed that Anthony was wearing a soiled shirt, that his cuffs were slightly but perceptibly frayed, that his eyes were set in half-moons the color of cigar smoke. "'So I gathered,' he said, fixing his friend with his bright yellow eye. "'But where and how is Gloria? My God, Anthony, I've been hearing the doggondest stories about you two, even out in California, and when I get back to New York I find you've sunk absolutely out of sight. Why don't you pull yourself together?' "'Now listen.' chattered Anthony unsteadily. I can't stand a long lecture. We've lost money in a dozen ways, and naturally people have talked, on account of the lawsuit, but the thing's coming to a final decision this winter, surely. You're talking so fast that I can't understand you, interrupted Dick calmly. Well, I've said all I'm going to say, snapped Anthony. Come and see us if you like, or don't. With this he turned and started to walk off in the crowd, but Dick overtook him suddenly and grasped his arm. "'Say, Anthony, don't fly off the handle so easily. You know Gloria's my cousin, and you're one of my oldest friends, so it's natural for me to be interested when I hear that you're going to the dogs and taking her with you.' "'I don't want to be preached to.' "'Well, then, all right. How about coming up to my apartment and having a drink? I've just got settled. I've bought three cases of Gordon gin from a revenue officer.' As they walked along, he continued in a burst of exasperation. "'And how about your grandfather's money? You going to get it?' Well, answered Anthony resentfully, that old fool hate seems hopeful, especially because people are tired of reformers right now. You know, it might make a slight difference, for instance, if some judge thought that Adam Patch made it harder for him to get liquor. You can't do without money, said Dick sententiously. Have you tried to write any lately? Anthony shook his head silently. That's funny, said Dick. I always thought that you and Maury would write some day and now he's grown to be a sort of tight-fisted aristocrat, and you're... I'm the bad example. I wonder why. You probably think you know, suggested Anthony, with an effort at concentration. The failure and the success both believe in their hearts that they have accurately balanced points of view. The success because he's succeeded, and the failure because he's failed. The successful man tells his son to profit by his father's good fortune, and the failure tells his son to profit by his father's mistakes. I don't agree with you, said the author of A Shave Tale in France. I used to listen to you and Maury when we were young, and I used to be impressed because you were so consistently cynical, but now, well, 
After all, by God, which of us three has taken to the to the intellectual life? I don't want to sound vainglorious, but it's me, and I've always believed that moral values existed, and I always will. Well, objected Anthony, who was rather enjoying himself. Even granting that, you know that, in practice, life never presents problems as clear-cut, does it? It does to me. There's nothing I'd violate certain principles for. But how do you know when you're violating them? You have to guess at things, just like most people do. You have to apportion the values when you look back. You finish up the portrait, then paint in the details and shadows. Dick shook his head with a lofty stubbornness. Same old feudal cynic, he said. It's just a mode of being sorry for yourself. You don't do anything, so nothing matters. Oh, I'm quite capable of self-pity, admitted Anthony. Nor am I claiming that I'm getting as much fun out of life as you are. You say, at least you used to, that happiness is the only thing worthwhile in life. Do you think you're any happier for being a pessimist? Anthony grunted savagely. His pleasure in the conversation began to wane. He was nervous and craving for a drink. My golly, he cried, where do you live? I can't keep walking forever. Your endurance is all mental, eh? returned Dick sharply. Well, I live right here. He turned in at the apartment house on 49th Street, and a few minutes later they were in a large new room with an open fireplace and four walls lined with books. A colored butler served them gin rickies, and an hour vanished politely with the mellow shortening of their drinks and the glow of a light mid-autumn fire. The arts are very old, said Anthony after a while. With the few glasses, the tension of his nerves relaxed, and he found that he could think again. Which art? All of them. Poetry is dying fast. It'll be absorbed into prose sooner or later. For instance, the beautiful word, the colored and glittering word, and the beautiful simile belong in prose now. To get attention, poetry has got to strain for the unusual word, the harsh, earthy word that's never been beautiful before. Beauty, as the sum of several beautiful parts, reached its apotheosis in Swinburne. It can't go any further, except in the novel, perhaps. Dick interrupted him impatiently. You know these new novels make me tired. My God, everywhere I go some silly girl asks me if I've read This Side of Paradise. Are our girls really like that? If it's true to life, which I don't believe, the next generation is going to the dogs. I'm sick of all this shoddy realism. I think there's a place for the romanticist in literature. Anthony tried to remember what he had read lately of Richard Caramel's. There was A Shave Tale in France, a novel called The Land of Strong Men, and several dozen short stories which were even worse. It had become the custom among young and clever reviewers to mention Richard Caramel with a smile of scorn. Mr. Richard Caramel, they called him. His corpse was dragged obscenely through every literary supplement. He was accused of making a great fortune by writing trash for the movies. As the fashion in books shifted, he was becoming almost a byword of contempt. While Anthony was thinking this, Dick had got to his feet, and seemed to be hesitating at an avowal. "'I've gathered quite a few books,' he said suddenly. "'So I see. I've made an exhaustive collection of good American stuff, old and new. I don't mean the usual Longfellow Whittier thing. In fact, most of it's modern.' He stepped to one of the walls, and, seeing that it was expected of him, Anthony arose and followed. Look! Under a printed tag Americana, he displayed six long rows of books, beautifully bound and, obviously, carefully chosen. And here are the contemporary novelists. Then Anthony saw the Joker. Wedged in between Mark Twain and Dreiser were eight strange and inappropriate volumes, the works of Richard Caramel, the demon lover, true enough, but also seven others that were execrably awful, without sincerity or grace. Unwillingly, Anthony glanced at Dick's face and caught a slight uncertainty there. I've put my own books in, of course, said Richard Caramel hastily, though one or two of them are uneven. I'm afraid I wrote a little too fast when I had that magazine contract. But I don't believe in false modesty. Of course some of the critics haven't paid so much attention to me since I've been established. But, after all, it's not the critics that count. They're just sheep. For the first time in so long that he could scarcely remember, Anthony felt a touch of the old pleasant contempt for his friend. Richard Caramel continued. My publishers, you know, have been advertising me as the Thackeray of America because of my New York novel. Yes, Anthony managed to muster. I suppose there's a good deal in what you say. He knew that his contempt was unreasonable. He knew that, 
he would have changed places with Dick unhesitatingly. He himself had tried his best to write with his tongue in his cheek. Ah, well, then. Can a man disparage his life work so readily? And that night, while Richard Caramel was hard at toil, with great hittings of the wrong keys and screwings up of his weary, unmatched eyes, laboring over his trash far into those cheerless hours when the fire dies down and the head is swimming from the effect of prolonged concentration, Anthony, abominably drunk, was sprawled across the back seat of a taxi on his way to the flat on Claremont Avenue. End of Book 3, Chapter 3, Part 1 of 2